tonight, my part, we're doing kind of old school. Uh, we got a lot of ground to cover, and I just felt that it would be better, considering the topic, if we do it where you, know, you have a chance to uh, uh, ask questions, and I've got a chance to pace back and forth, and not be tied to a computer and a uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. That being said, so tonight, the $64,000 question. Will you get asked this uh, as a licensed battlefield guide? Yeah, yeah most assuredly. Um, can it be fraught with peril? Yes, yes it can. Um, we actually, I found myself kind of pulled into doing a, uh, uh, a talk with a bunch of other national parks on an online course on interpreting uh, controversial subjects. And they all said, well, well, why do you go there? I said, well, because it's a civil war. We really can't avoid it, uh, particularly in Mississippi. So it's something that we have always, it's part of our job to just take this, this head on. Are some people still fighting it on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line? Absolutely, absolutely. So there is a degree of controversy to it. We do not shy away from it. What I'm going to do is, is tell you how to you know, maneuver your way through the minefield. Uh, as long as we're all on kind of the same sheet of music, if you get yourself into a minefield, we will help come extricate you. If you say, you know what, I'm a Civil War expert, I'm going to tell it my way, uh, and you wander off from us herded wildebeests among the lionesses, we're all going to look at each other and moo and look at you, ooh, ouch, ooh, oh, that sucks. So, why are we discussing this? Because this is part of our job. We are a Civil War battlefield. Who was the enemy during the Civil War? We were. Now, this is one of those strange things in history where half of our population fought the other half of the population. I remember breaking one of my seasonal's hearts accidentally when he was talking about his great uncle, who was killed charging up Little Round Top without even thinking about it. Well, that sucks. I hope my great grandfather wasn't the one that shot him. Because he was <laughs> on top of Little Round Top. I, Rocky looked like a slap puppy. I was like, wow, it's still morning. Um, but we have to always remember that our audience, the people who pay to get in here, our fellow American citizens, have relatives on both sides of the battle. And we here at Vicksburg honor the defenders of Vicksburg as well as honoring the Union troops who came away from here to victory. And I'm very proud to honor both sides. It's a little tricky in some of these things. If you're a big fan for the internet, and by the way, if you read it on the internet, it can't possibly be wrong, right? <laughs> the Park Service is accused of having the official government version of the Civil War. Is there an official version of the Civil War? No, not here. I am not the thought police. We are not the thought police. I am not going to tell you what you need to think. What I'm going to tell you are the facts as we have researched them. And ideally, as interpreters here, what we will do with the visitors is what I will attempt to do with you tonight. I'm going to give you the facts. You will give them the facts, unvarnished, unbiased, and let the visitor make up their mind as to what they felt the war was about. Remember, they've got to make this personal connection we talked about last week. So we give them the facts, we give them the information, we do it apolitically, and we let the visitor make up their own mind. Because we're not the thought police. What is the version that I'm going to give you tonight, and why is it the preferred version? Well, when it comes to interpretation the National Park Service, we do have an order from the director, and that is that our interpretation will incorporate the best known sources of research. When it comes to the Civil War, what we're looking at is documented primary resources. Not what somebody recollects or wrote down in 1892 or 1917, what they were saying and what they were doing from 1861 to 1865. As long as we base our interpretation on documented primary resources, can we be wrong? Again, not telling them how to think or what to think, but saying, 
Here is what those people said in their own words. Here is what the soldiers' diary said. Here is what the political documents of the day said. That that I'm going to present tonight is based upon years of research. Is it the quote-unquote official version of the National Park Service? Pretty much. Uh, we, but we arrived at it independently, they and I, because I tend to believe everything I read on the internet and mistrust the government as well. So, But this, if, if it sounds like um, there is an official version, it's not so much that it's an official version. Um, it, it's if, if everybody reads the same original documents, and you are a, a historian, you're going to come up, maybe not the exact same takeaway, but it's going to be very similar, very close. So, the first big question, what caused the Civil War? Any guesses? Secession. There you go. Slavery. <laughs> Slavery. The man in the back gets a goofy dog. All those things, economics, slavery, sectionalism, that had existed since we were colonies. One event turns it into a Donnybrook. That was secession. So the quick, real easy question is what caused the Civil War? Secession. They fired on Fort Sumter in South Carolina Harbor. By the way, first stones of the war, January 9, 1861. When the Star of the West was attempting to resupply Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, the students of the Citadel fired on it from Morris Island. Those were the first guns fired in anger, not the later ones in April. The second guns fired in anger in the Civil War? January 13th, 1861. Fort Hill, Vicksburg, Mississippi. When we fired on the, um, okay, Dan, what's her name? The Tyler, the A.O. Tyler, oh, Tyler, which was just doing one of his mercantile runs from St. Louis down to New Orleans, and all of a sudden, the, the, the story was it was full of wide awakes, a young Republican political paramilitary gang who was going to sack Vicksburg. So we missed being the first guns in the Civil War by less than a week. And we are the second guns, and we're the first guns in the West. So <coughs> secession causes the war. But really, to address the, 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 the question properly, you've got to split it into <coughs> two parts. First of all, the first question is, who starts wars? You and me? Politicians. Politicians start the war. And they are usually representing um, Joe Sixpack? Remember he was, that was the political figure a couple of elections ago? No. I, I got a kick out of this whole Occupy Wall Street and stuff like, they're the 2%. Really? You thought this was new? You know, Wall Street wanted to actually secede in 1861 because it was making so money from both sides. They said, we'll just become the independent city of New York and openly profit from the war by trading with both sides. So the 2% have always been with us, ladies and gentlemen. So the first part of the question we need to look at is, why did the politicians start the war? The second one, because they're not always the same, in fact, they're rarely the same, is why did the average man, both North and South, go off to fight in this war that the politicians started? We have, over the years, been told a number of traditional causes of the war. And you need to be familiar with them. And, and, and there, there is some merit to the arguments that you will hear, depending on how strongly they feel that particular cause was the, was the, was the end all. The first one you're going to hear about is tariffs. Well, the war was about tariffs because the North was taking economic advantage of the South. Is that on the face of it a true statement? Yeah, yeah, more or less. Well, first of all, what is a tariff? Now, remember, in the 19th century, there is no income tax. The federal government gets its money in two ways, from a, a direct tax upon the states, where they say, OK, we need X amount to run the federal government. And by the way, what they're looking for now, Henry Clay, on Clay Street's named after him, was talking about the American plan, where to him and the early uh, uh, government, federal government <coughs> proponents were saying, look, we collect taxes from everyone. And then we construct things for the common good. We will build turnpikes. We will help with canals. We will dredge harbors and put out aids to navigation. Because by doing so, we will then, in improving the infrastructure, 
we will aid the private sector in developing American commerce, which is what we're really all about, uh, about is trying to get uh, the American economy up and going. So there is no income tax. In fact, there's no income tax since 1913. So direct taxes upon the states, based on population, and also tariffs. And that is charging an import and an export duty on products coming and going to and from the United States. That was how we financed the, uh, the national government. And did right from the beginning. It doesn't become protectionist and nationalistic in nature until the tariff of 1816. Because of the Napoleonic War, the Europe is in chaos, there's really no big markets. British manufacturing, which is in its infancy, the Industrial Revolution has just really started in the 1780s and 1790s, but it's starting on this side of the pond as well as over there. They got a little bit of a head start on us, but New England, they found that those, uh, those rocky rivers were a whole lot easier to turn a mill than it was to farm. So in 1816, the first tariff, the first protectionist tariff, is put into place, and it was to keep Britain from dumping underpriced manufacturing items on us. We had just come out of the War of 1812, there was still some political uh, um, long shadows from the war. And the Americans, North and South, thought, you know what, we need to protect our manufacturing because we were caught flat-footed going into the War of 1812. We did not have the manufacturers to build arms, to build ships. And, well, we got our capital burned for one thing as a result of our, our preparedness. So both North and South support the tariff of 1816 because we, we had just come out, of the war, uh, come out of the war and felt that, yeah, we did need to build up some of our federal government, some of our military capacity, and we did not want the British, by dumping underpriced goods, they were selling them here cheaper than we could manufacture them. It was, it was clear and outright dumping. Interestingly enough, uh, John Calhoun, John C. Calhoun, who we're going to hear about a lot later with the different tariff, he supports this. The tariff itself in 1816, depending on the uh, particular item, is between 20 and 30 percent. So it's nationalistic. Now, after the uh, tariff of 1816, you're going to see a split in support for the tariff. Basically, from here on in, the industrial north is much more in favor of protectionist tariffs than the agricultural south. Because it affects the agricultural south in two ways. If we put high tariffs on things that we are selling to England, they buy less of them. And what are they buying from the South? They're buying agricultural goods, and, and we're making the transition from tobacco, rice, indigo, to cotton as being the primary cash crop. So the more we put taxes on them, the less we're going to sell. That also puts the South where they've only got really two places to buy machinery and manufactured goods down here. That's either from the North or from overseas. Uh, if there's a protectionist tariff, that means the Northern manufacturers can charge more or they're going to have to buy a piece of British or French machinery and pay the <coughs> import tariff. So it raises prices on consumer goods that the Southerners are trying to buy and it also um, hurts them as, uh, on, the, uh, on the tax end of it as well. They're paying more for it. The tariff of 1824 goes up to 35%. Again, that's going to be opposed in the South. Then we get to the tariff of abomination. Now, we've just gone through a couple of years, so we should be able to grasp this whole concept very well. Political brinkmanship. Remember sequestration last year? You know what? If my party doesn't get what it wants, or this other party doesn't get what that want, we're going to come up with an automatic thing that is so heinous so horrible that no right-thinking person would ever let it go through and get passed. Well, that's what they do with the tariff of 1828. It not only puts it to the southern farmers on agricultural goods, it puts it to all the raw materials that the northern manufacturing. It's a trick put together by Martin Van Buren to embarrass John Quincy Adams and get Andy Jackson elected president. Not your Andy Jackson. Um, unfortunately, enough people look at it and say, well, you know, maybe it is something we need. It passes. It was never meant to pass. So that has taxes of, in some items, over 50%. The average is like 45, 
import-export duties. Uh, does it go over well? No. Does it, in the North, not particularly. They, they hate it because it's taxing their raw materials. <coughs> in the South, they refer to it as the tariff of abomination, and it begins to cause some very serious problems. Interesting political fallout to it, though. It causes John Quincy Adams to lose the election. Andy Jackson is elected, but he probably would have been anyway. But Jackson's got this tariff on, and before he can really do anything, in fact, he does. He comes up with the tariff of 1832, which drops at about 10%. But by this time, South Carolina has already got their shorts in the big knot, and they say, we're not paying it. We're not paying it. And they invoke, and this is one of the first times and places you will hear states' rights being invoked. South Carolina says that we've read the founding paperwork, and we believe that we have the right to nullify a law passed by the federal government that we don't agree with. And we don't agree with the tariff of abomination or the tariff of 1832, so we refuse to collect it in the state of South Carolina. This does not go over well with Andy Jackson. Now, South Carolina kind of comes out there figuring that the rest of the southern agricultural states will also jump up and say, yeah, me too. They all go, no, no, they're getting Andy Jackson real man. We're just going to kind of watch and see how, see how it works out for South Carolina before we commit ourselves. Jackson actually begins to raise troops and raise money. He is going to launch a military expedition to South Carolina to teach them that they need to mind their Uncle Sam. Before this happens, he also, Congress passes, when they pass the uh, bill that allows him to get down and take military action, they also pass another compromise tariff, the tariff of 1833, and South Carolinians go, oh, well, that's all we wanted in the first place. We're good with that. And Andy goes, well, I don't really need to come down and invade you because now we, we, we're, we're back on the same track. So the concept of nullification, states' rights, is a result of the tariffs. We get there's a tariff of 1846, there's a bunch of them, and they're all in the 30 to 40 percent range. And again, if you look at all the tariffs, who are they harder on, the north or the south? south. The south. The south is much more uh, sensitive to anything that affects imports or exports because that's, you know, uh, later on when we get into the economy, 85 percent of southern cotton is shipped to Great Britain. So anything that's going to affect that hits southerners in the pocket. Then we come to the last tariff before the Civil War, the tariff of 1857. It is created by Virginian Robert Hunter. Its rate, 16%. It's the lowest tariff in the history of the Republic. Again, its, it's, um, it, its revenues are being used to develop infrastructure primarily in the South, Southern harbors and Southern rivers and stuff. So, this is where, when they say, well, it was all about tariffs, you have to stop as a historian and say, wait a minute. For 50 years, you had all these terrible tariffs, and all of a sudden they dropped to the lowest point in history, and they're using it to, to, to mark navigation and, 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 and great new harbors. You go, well, if you're going to be that way about it, we quit. So it begs the question, if tariffs, do they play into it? Yes, they do. Did the South secede over tariffs? No, they did not, because at the time of secession, the tariffs of 1857 are the ones that are in effect. And, um, right, in fact, as soon as the southern states secede, on March 2nd, 1861, the Morrill tariffs come in, and they're back up to 30 or 40 percent, but there's no southern uh, uh, delegation in the House of Representatives or Washington to do anything about it. So the tariffs do go back up. Now we get to the second thing that we hear. And that is, next to tariffs, what is the most common cause you will hear, particularly in the South, as to why they secede? States' rights. States' rights. Okay? And here's the question. When someone says states' rights, the first question I ask is, the states' right to do what? What is it that Maine, or Vermont, or Michigan, or Minnesota are being allowed to do that South Carolina, Mississippi, and Alabama can. Sell marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't watch it. I said sell marijuana. Gives a whole new meaning to Rocky Mountain High, don't it? 
it just so runs. It just let's take a look at, for a minute at the decades <laughs> leading up to the Civil War. Whose states' rights were actually kind of being, you know, uh, preyed upon, and, and who was doing the praying? Who, who was kind of trying to, you know, their piece of dessert, their piece of cake is bigger than ours. Let's start right in 1787 with the Three Fifths Compromise. Now, the South looks around, and realizes that you know they've got at that point pretty much as many black people, if not more, depending on where you're living, than white people. They don't have a whole lot of white people. Representation in the House of Representatives is based on what? Population. Population. So they say, well, um, even though they're nothing more in our book than farm animals, we want to count our slaves towards population. North of what? They said, well, yeah, we, 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 want, we don't want to hand over the House of Representatives to the, excuse me, to the North. We want to count our slaves towards <laughs> representation. The North goes, <laughs> okay. But remember we talked about that direct tax thing? Fine, you want to count them as population? We tax you based on that. The South goes, oh, no, we, we, we didn't really want to do that. We just wanted the population to count for representation. So the three-fifth compromise is, okay, we will use a black man, a slave, counted as three-fifths of a human being for the purpose of the census and also for tax purposes. That was the compromise. Now, who is that benefiting? Why can't, I mean, Vermont doesn't have many people either. Why can't they count their farm animals? Do you think South Carolina is going to sign up? Well, you got a lot of Holsteins. Three-fifths of a Holstein will, will count it. So right from the get-go, the South says, well, our system of economics is going to penalize us in population, but we've got all these people who, well, we don't even call them people. We have all this chattel that we want to count towards our representation. So they're already getting a leg up in the House of Representatives based on people who are not citizens, who are not even legally people, according to the United States Constitution. In 1793 is the first Fugitive Slave Act. And it's applied to white indentured servants as well as black and Indian slaves. And one of the clauses of, this, of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 is that if my slave leaves the Mississippi and goes into a state where there is no, where slavery is illegal, which at that point most of New England, New York, uh, not, not New York yet, New England in 1780, um, Massachusetts, my slave escapes to Boston, for example. I have the right to go capture them and bring them back. And supposedly, the northern states were supposed to assist the slave hunters in doing it. Did they? Like, you know what? They make it as far as Boston. Good for them. We are not going to use our state resources chasing down slaves when we have made slavery illegal in our state. So if you're in Massachusetts and the federal government at the behest of the southern states is telling you you have to chase down somebody else's chattel property and return it, whose state's rights are, are preeminent here, the slave-owning states or the states that have outlawed exactly. slavery. See, again, the North looking like, well, you know, it's not that big a deal. For the most part, we're going to ignore it, but if it makes them happy, we'll go ahead and go with it. Most of the Northern states passed what they call personal liberty laws to counter the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. If you're a slave and you're caught and you're brought in, they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. First, we have to find out if, in fact, this is a fugitive, a runaway, or if this is, in fact, a free man. Uh, that movie, A Twelve Years a Slave, Solomon Northrup, he, he was kidnapped about five miles from my house, where I grew up in New York State, around Saratoga Springs. His uh, parents lived on a farm in North Pusik. Uh He was kidnapped and brought down to New Orleans. So the personal liberty laws in the northern states actually set up a trial. But the trial is before a northern state magistrate and before a local uh, uh, jury. You think they returned a lot of them? Made the Southerners apoplectic. Wait a minute, you know, you're supposed to be doing this, and now you're putting up trials, giving them rights that they shouldn't be accorded because they're not people. They should not have a right to trial. That's not the way the Constitution outlines it. 
So, in fact, that struck down the, uh, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, Prigg versus Pennsylvania, 1842, strikes down the constitutionality of all the personal liberty laws in the North. Again, here are, law, here are states that say, in our state, before you can take a person out of our state in chains, they have the right of due process. They have the right to establish before a judge whether or not they are, in fact, a runaway and property, or they are, in fact, a free man. Now you've got the federal government saying, you know what, we don't care what your legislature has passed. We don't care what your state laws say. Your sovereignty now ends. Our Supreme Court says your personal liberty laws are unconstitutional and throws them out. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 makes it even more so because we're not even going to leave you a chance to do it with your local magistrates. We're going to form federal judges, federal commissioners, and if a slave hunter goes north, captures a slave, he brings him before one of these federal commissioners, and the slave uh, the owner, the slave owner, pays the commissioner. The commissioner gets ten dollars if he returns the slave to the owner. He gets five dollars if he doesn't. Hmm, sway the jury a little bit on that one, you think? <coughs> it's worse. It also goes up and says that federal marshals will be used to help capture slaves in states where slavery is not, is not legal. And a federal marshal can grab you and you and you, so you're coming out with me, you're my posse, we're going to go out because we've heard there's slaves that went up the Underground Railroad and they're out in that swamp. And if you refuse to assist me in this slave hunt, I arrest you and charge you with treason. Treason. So again, you can go into a state where slavery is not legal, and you can press gang citizens of those states into slave hunts under penalty of treason. States' rights? See, it's starting to get a little dicey. The sectionalism is starting to get strong. The South is saying they're not cooperating, they're not abiding by the rules of the Constitution. The, the, uh, the North is saying, you know what? We're getting a little tired of everybody coming in and using the federal government like a hammer on us, telling us what we can and can't do, and under penalty of treason, treason against the United States. There's a, there's a famous case called the Christiana case about the treason uh, in, Pencils, in Pennsylvania. Just to make sure that there was no doubt about what rights slaves, blacks, had or didn't have. In 1857 is the Supreme Court case, the Dred Scott decision, where Judge Taney from Maryland, a slave state, in order to just keep Congress out of it, says, you know what, I'll settle it once and for all. Blacks are not, nor can they ever be, citizens of the United States of America. And as such, the protections of the Constitution do not apply to them. The Negro has no rights under the Constitution and cannot appear before a federal judge or a federal court, period. On top of that, the New England states counter by saying, you know what? Okay, they can't be citizens of the federal government or the republic, but the states' rights, we're going to use the nullification process. They invoke, by the way, the nullification process that South Carolina comes up with on the personal liberty laws. They do it again and say, we can make blacks citizens of our states. They can't vote in the federal elections, but they can vote in the state elections. Maine, <coughs> Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and Rhode Island, five of the six New England states, grant citizenship to free black males. No women can vote, you know, no matter what color they are at that point, in New England. New York does, but it gives a $250 property requirement. If you're a free black and can produce $250 worth of net value, you can also vote in New York State. How do you think South Carolina <laughs> reacts to this? Here is a Supreme Court case saying that these people are not citizens, they have no rights, and New England grants them the right to vote. Under states' rights, under the nullification, uh, the whole legal argument put forth by, um, by uh, uh, John C. Calhoun on nullification, 
Does the New England states have the state's rights to decide who votes in their elections and who doesn't? They thought so. South Carolina did not think the state's rights doctrine applied to pretty much any other state in South Carolina. So that does not go over well. There's a case of Lemon versus New York, and again, it happens in 1853, it also flares up in 1860. It's actually mentioned in the Ordinance of Secession, the Statement of Grievances of South Carolina, where a family from Virginia is going to Texas, but they go up to New York to get on another boat. They put their slaves in a boarding house. A free black finds out they're in the boarding house, goes to a judge, gets a writ of habeas corpus, and takes them because Again, there's no law in New York that says they have to stay there as slaves. The minute they were put in the boarding house and left on their own, they were free under New York law. That's the way. Excuse me, that's the way the judge finds it in 1853, and again, when Virginia appeals the law in 1860. But now there's another nail in that coffin. So, we talked about states' rights. We talked about the rights. Why? In their own words, let's go back to primary sources. What does the South say? What do Southerners, <coughs> Southern politicians say as the reason that they secede? In South Carolina, now there's, there's ordinance of secessions, which are very short, very legal. And then there's statements of grievances, declarations of, of grievances. And I'll, uh, this is the only time I'll read to you, just because I, I think, well, again, it's their words. so. Bear with me for a moment. I'll just do some of South Carolina's and I'll do Mississippi's. Part of Mississippi is even more succinct. <coughs> South Carolina says, and I quote, And now the state of South Carolina, having resumed her separate and equal place among nations, deems it due to herself and the remaining United States of America and to the nations of the world that she should declare the immediate causes that have led to this act. On the 4th of July, 1776, in a declaration by the colonies, quote, that they are and of right ought to be free and independent states, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may do. This is a state saying that they have the right to declare war. Make a All those clauses in the federal constitution are reserved strictly to the federal government. South Carolina claims it for her own based on a line in the Declaration of Independence. We hold that the government thus established is subject to the two great principles asserted in the Declaration of Independence. And we hold further that the mode of its formation subjects it to a third fundamental, a fundamental principle, namely the law of compact. We maintain that in every compact between two or more parties, the obligation is mutual, that the failure of one of the contracting parties to perform a material part of the agreement entirely releases the obligation of the other, and that where no arbiter is provided, each party is remitted to his own judgment to determine the fact of failure with all its consequences. In the present case, that fact is established with certainty. We assert that 14 of the states have deliberately refused for years past to fulfill their constitutional obligations and will refer to their own statutes for the proof. The Constitution of the United States in its fourth article provides as follows. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Thus, the constituted compact has been deliberately broken and disregarded by the non-slaveholding states, and the consequence follows that South Carolina is released from her obligation. We affirm that these ends for which this government was instituted have been defeated, and the government itself has been made destructive of them by the action of the non-slaveholding states. Those states have assumed the right of deciding upon the propriety of our domestic institutions and have denied the rights of property established in 15 of the states and recognized by the Constitution. They have denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. They have permitted open establishment among them of societies whose avowed object is to disturb the peace and to align the property of the citizens of other states. 
They have encouraged and assisted thousands of our slaves to leave their homes, and those who remain have been incited by emissaries, books, and pictures to servile insurrection. A geographical line has been drawn across the Union, and all the states north of that line have united in the election of a man to the high office of President of the United States whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. He is to be entrusted with the administration of the common government because he has declared that, quote, government cannot endure permanently half slave, half free. And that the public mind must rest in the belief that slavery is in the course of ultimate extinction. This sectional combination to the submersion of the Constitution has been aided in some of the states by elevating to citizenship persons who, by the supreme law of the land, are incapable of becoming citizens, and their votes have been used to inaugurate a new policy, hostile to the South and destructive of its beliefs and safety. On the fourth day of March next, this party will take possession of the government. It is announced that the South shall be excluded from the common territory, that the judicial tribunal shall be made sectional, and that a war must be waged against slavery until it shall cease throughout the United States. The guarantees of the Constitution will no longer exist. The equal rights of the states will be lost. The slave-holding states will no longer have the power of self-government or self-protection, and the federal government will have become their enemy. Is there anything not clear about why South Carolina is leaving the Union? Now, Mississippi is much more succinct and much more eloquent in our phraseology. Mississippi says, in the momentous step which our state has taken of dissolving its connection with the government of which we so long formed a part, it is but just that we should declare the prominent reasons which have induced our pain. <clears throat> our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce of the earth. These products are peculiar to the climate verging on the tropical regions, and by an imperious law of nature, none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun. These products have become necessities of the world, and a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. That blow has been long aimed at the institution and was at the point of reaching its consummation. There was no choice left us but submission to the mandates of abolition or dissolution of the Union, whose principles had been subverted to work out our ruin. Utter subjugation awaits us in the Union if we should consent longer to remain in it. It is not a matter of choice, but of necessity. We must either submit to degradation and to the loss of property worth four billions of money, or we must secede from the union framed by our fathers to secure this as well as every other species of property. For far less cause than this, our fathers separated from the crown of England. Tim, can, can I interrupt you just sure. for a minute? Uh, I totally agree that secession uh, leads to war. Uh, Lincoln is elected ab abolitionist, uh, believe in abolishing slavery goes to war to bring the nation back together, will not tolerate the nation being uh, with the other states to see. But, but, but what's the common theme? And, and you just struck on it right there in your comments. What is the common theme between, uh, behind all of these things? And it's slavery. It is slavery. It, it is slavery. And, 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 and as the <coughs> nation grows and expands in new territories, are they going to be free states, slave states? Uh, the compromises that all occur mm -hmm. in uh, 1854 to 37, all of those things, the common thing that caused the war is slavery. And here's the thing. We can't stop at that. It is. And, and as we get on, again, what I'm putting out to you, and the conclusion I'm hoping you draw, is the common thing, what Harry just said. What issue touches every other issue? It's slavery. Money. Slavery, okay, but, and, and you're right, and, and exactly, you hit the nail on the head. It's not the institution of slavery, it's not like everybody sat around on the front porch with a jewel, you know, this owning people thing is pretty cool. That, and sometimes, 
people will focus on the institution of slavery. And, and that's not the story. That's not the whole story. But there's also a lot from the other side of the Mason-Dixon line who get very angry at us because they go, oh, well, all the Yankees talk about is slavery. Uh, the Park Service is the Yankee agency. All they talk about is slavery. Ladies and gentlemen, did I just read to you from a Park Service document? That was what the state of South Carolina and the state of Mississippi stated as their primary grievances for dissolving their legal relationship with the United States of America. What I'm going to get to now is why. So, the Confederacy, of course, comes up with its own constitution, very similar to the United States one. Right, just a couple of clauses here. Section 9, the importation of Negroes of the African race from any foreign country other than the slave-holding states or territories of the United States of America is hereby forbidden. And Congress is required to pass such laws as shall effectively prevent the same. Congress shall also have power to prohibit the introduction of slaves from any state, not a member of or territory not belonging to this Confederacy. Now, remember in Mississippi they talked about the slaves being worth four billions? We'll get to that. But you can't import any fresh ones? Does that keep the, uh, the, the value of your, of your stock up? Oh, yes, most assuredly. And we'll touch on that again. This one here, Section 4, no bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. The Constitution of the Confederate States of America, in black and white, says there will be absolutely positive, there's no law passed of any sort whatsoever that shall make illegal the institution of Negro slavery. So it, where that is never but inferred, in the American Constitution, the Constitution of the United States, it's in black and white in the federal, in the, in the federal one. Also, no slave or other person held to service or labor in any state or territory of the Confederate States, the laws thereof, escaping or lawfully carried into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such slave belongs, or to whom such service or labor may be due. Just to make sure everyone understands that, speaking to the paper, in fact, I think which one, the uh, Savannah Republican on March 21st, 1861, shortly after the Confederate Constitution was ratified, Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, says the following, the new Constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution, African slavery, as it exists among us. The proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution. Jefferson in his forecast had anticipated this as the, quote, rock upon which the old union would split, end quote. He was right. What was conjecture with him is now a realized fact. Our foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. That's the Vice President of the Confederate States of America. I mean, you know, and he's speaking on the record to one of the leading newspapers in the South. Again, Now, here's where, let's get away from the institution. We know what the institution is. Let's take a look at it and why why was the South willing to rip a country apart and go to war against an enemy twice in size with all the manufacturing? You know, if you're going to pick a war, don't pick one with somebody who's got twice as many people and all the factories that make guns in the country. <laughs> so they, they knew they were taking a huge chance. Why? What was the point? Let's look at the economics of slavery. According to the, uh, the census of 1860, and it's interesting, depending on which article you read, they're giving you different numbers, but they're close. Once in 4.8% of the South, uh, only 4.8% of the Southern population owned one or more slaves. I've seen that in other sources as high as 8%. But even if we take the high figure, that means that 92% of all white Southerners didn't own anybody. They did not own a slave. Now, the top 1 or 2% owned hundreds. There are 4 million slaves in the United States in the census of 1860. All but like 50 or 60,000 of them live in the 11 states that will secede 
form the Confederate States of America. Slave constituted, again, the census of 1870, 12.7% of the U.S. population, just under 4 million people, primarily in the South. A healthy slave in 1860, uh, if he was a field worker, you'd want, you know, health and vigor and strength, or if you were in an urban situation, if they were a craftsperson, they were a cooper or a brewer or had, had a skill, a carpenter or, or, or what have you, in, in, in modern currency, they could be worth up to $120,000 per individual. Or more. What's that? Or more. Or more. Yeah, and again, depending on, there's several articles out there, uh, depending <coughs> on the 2011, uh, uh, and, and again, if, if this guy was a really good leather worker or cooper or brewer, yeah, you can probably get it. But stop and think. 120, how many of you own a car worth $120,000 or more? <laughs> not me. So we're not talking small change here. No <laughs> Well, it gets, even, it gets even worse. The aggregate value, market value, of the slaves themselves was estimated at $3 billion in 1860 money. Again, depending on which source you, you believe, that today would be 10 to $15 <coughs> trillion dollars of worth, of value. The slaves in the southern United States in 1860 with the greatest concentration of material wealth in the history of the world. That's what the Mississippi Statement of Grievances is talking about, the greatest wealth in the world. Those four million slaves was the greatest concentration of material wealth the world had ever seen. In fact, those four million southern Negro slaves were worth more than all the northern mines, mills, factories, Boundaries, railroads, and canals put together. Who, in 1860, 1960, 2013, 2014, is going to walk away and leave 10 to 15 trillion dollars on the table? What national government is going to have the money to buy that out? Great Britain spends 33 million pounds to buy out the planters of the Caribbean when they do so in the 1830s. It's an incredible, it was half of all the wealth of the British Empire while they were doing that. Was Washington in a position to do so? Even if it wanted to. But again, the not here said it was about wealth, it was about money. Yes, and we're not talking small wealth, we're talking about the greatest accumulation of wealth in the history of the world. The Southerners see a threat to that in the election of Abraham Lincoln. Cotton was 60% of the gross domestic product of the United States, not the Southern states. 60% of our GDP is King Cotton. Is it just the South that's profiting from this? The financiers, the shippers, the insurance companies, where are they located? Wall Street, in New York City, okay? The Industrial Revolution in the Northeast, what is the basis of the Industrial Revolution in New England, in New York, in Pennsylvania? Textile. Textiles, and specifically what two kinds of textiles? Cotton and wool. Cotton and wool. Cotton and wool. All my years of research, I have never found a letter from a New England mill owner or a fellow New Yorker writing to a southern planter that says, look, I'll tell you, we'll, we'll pay you twice the price per bale if you pay the help. So, if you get a Yankee who says, well, it was all the South. South caused the war with their slaves. The North profited just as much. 60% of the gross domestic product of the United States of America is based on one crop. And what is that crop's production based on? Slavery. African slavery. Okay? See how we're going here? It's, it's, <laughs> I'll get to some modern similes here in a little bit. 85% of the southern cotton crop is shipped to Great Britain. How many of you guys watch Downton Abbey? What do you think? Only one, really? I'm, I'm booked out. I have to be 
those beautiful big old British manor houses built in the early Victorian era, what do you think built them? They, they were cotton barons. Manchester, Leeds, the Midlands of England, again, cradle of their industrial revolution, is textile mills, specifically cotton mills and woolen mills. Cotton. Um, how many of you have ever been to Ireland? It was a beautiful place out in, out in the kind of <coughs> called Kylemore Abbey. If you haven't been, you've seen pictures of this beautiful uh, gothic looking mansion with just a, a, a hourglass uh, lake. I mean, just per he was a cotton baron. He made his money importing southern cotton to the mills of England. So it's not just the United States that's profiting off the back and the sweat of African slaves in the American <coughs> South. The British Empire is getting very, very rich on it as well. 85% of our import, or our export crop, I should say, is going to them. By the way, even at a 16% tax rate, 85% of that cotton is being exported. Is the federal government making money off of this? Oh, hand over fist. Let's look, uh, uh, one more thing. Natchez, city of millionaires. Again, depending on your source, three quarters of them say that Natchez had the highest per capita the number of millionaires in the country. Several other sources come out and say, no, half of all the millionaires in the census of 1860 live in Natchez. When I went through all the census data trying to come out, no, they're going to make me count everyone individually and try to figure out where they live. The life's too short for that. But let's just put it this way. Little Natchez, population 3,000, 3,500 at the time, was pretty much chock-a-block full of millionaires. This was the epicenter of King Cotton, right here in the Mississippi Valley. Let's look at the politics of slavery. Wealth equals power. You know the golden rule? <laughs> Not the biblical one, the other one. Those that have the gold make the rules. Who has the gold in mid 19th century America? The southern planters, the northern mill owners, financiers, bankers, and shippers. But the South is looking at a problem. If you're an Irish immigrant, a German immigrant, and you're looking at coming over to the United States, are you going to go to the north, where you have to compete with other starving immigrants? Or are you going to go to the south, where you have to compete with a labor force that isn't even paid? Where are the immigrants going? They're going to the north. By the millions, they're sailing in to Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. There are some coming to Charleston. Savannah and New Orleans, but far, far more are going to the north and then getting up to the old Northwest Territory, particularly the German Scandinavian, the Irish are tending to stick, stick to the coast. They, they had a bad experience with farming in the 1840s. They're not going to try it again. They stick close to the cities. We go back to how we judge representation in the House of Representatives? Population. The South sees the handwriting on the wall. It's, it's golden goose. Slavery is going to cost them their political power, even with the three-fifths rule, because millions of new immigrants are pouring into the dome. The Republican Party is a new party. Their platform was never, and, and Lincoln never came out and said, we are going to abolish slavery. As president, he, he was a lawyer. He said, I have no constitutional power to do it. One of the platforms of the Republican Party was to prevent slavery from spreading to the West. Now, here's where we get into a little agronomy. Cotton will exhaust soil. And in fact, by the Civil War, the, the chief cotton production area has left the East Coast, come across the Southern Highlands, and is here. Now, do we have a problem with depleting the soil here in the Delta? Every spring, old Muddy brings down the best topsoil from Iowa, Illinois, you know, the whole Midwest down and redeposits it. So we're not worried, but the rest of the Upland South is watching their crops diminish because the soil is being depleted. In the North, flax, same thing. Flax will just suck all the micronutrients out of, out of the soil. To keep the cotton kingdom going, it has to move to new areas. It's already into Texas. By the way, cotton needs colder, hot weather. Hot. So it needs hot weather, good soil, and water. That's all it needs. Texas is already a slave state. They're looking 
the planters are looking because they know that all right, their plantation in in Jackson or you know the uplands or even the black the the, the what they call the black belt there on the Mississippi Alabama border eventually is going to deplete. Their sons and grandsons to maintain the standard of living they have are going to go west. They're looking at New Mexico, the Rio Grande <coughs> Valley up through central New Mexico. They're looking at Arizona. By the way, what is one of the biggest cotton producing states in the United States now? Arizona. Pima cotton? Mm -hmm. Arizona. Sun, soil, add water. And by the way, did they have irrigation in Arizona before the Civil War? The Hohokam Indians were irrigating off the Salt River almost 2,000 years ago. So, yeah, it, it, we don't need to say, wow, thanks for the, you know, the engineering work. That, that seems to work really well. They're looking. And they've actually gone so far. California's already joined the union. They figure if they can get enough southerners into Southern California, they can do a plebiscite, split the state, and make Southern California a slave state. They knew their agronomy. They knew their agriculture. And they knew their economics. If the Republican president gets in power, if Republicans come into the House, what's going to happen to slavery in the territories? So. Lincoln is not a threat today. He's not saying, I'm putting you out of business tomorrow. What he's saying is, I'm, you, you better teach your, your, your sons and grandsons an honest trade. Because they're not moving west. But they can. But they're not bringing the slaves with them. So the threat is not an immediate one. But is it a threat? If you were a southern planter, would you see the incoming Lincoln administration as a threat? It most certainly was. Here we get in to... The 98% and the 2%. We talk about, okay, if, if, if only 8% at the most own slaves, where are the other 98% coming in? Why, if you don't own a slave, why would you want to go fight for a war? And we'll get into personal reasons here, but, but, but in, politically, why would you support the guy in the big fancy White House with all the slaves and the beautiful women and the great parties and stuff like that? When you're out working with your hands, why, why would you want to keep the 2% on top of the pot? If you were an immigrant, you were walking down the streets of any mill town in New York or New England, and you looked at the big fancy house, you'd say to yourself, one of these days, I'll be the one owning the mill, or the mine, or the foundry, and I'll be living in a house like that. What did the southerner think? He looked at the big house and said, someday, I'm going to have my slaves, I'm going to have my plantation." The ticket to wealth in the north was industry. The ticket to wealth in the south was what? Money. The plantation system, which depended on what? So, okay, I may have put my butt on the line to help that rich guy out, which, by the way, he doesn't have to go to war, neither does his sons, but I want to be like him. This is the only system of economics I've ever known. My path to wealth is through that. So from the beginning, the South goes to war to preserve the institution of slavery. We'll touch on it again here in a minute. Does the North go to war to end slavery? No, it does not. In 1861, it does not. The interesting thing is, in, when the North does go to war, what what is the what are the Northern politicians saying? If the Southern politicians are saying, you know what? They've interfered with our rights, they've interfered with our way of life, they've interfered with our economy, they've interfered with our society, they've interfered with our domestic institutions. I love that euphemism that South Carolina had for it. What is the North saying to its sons to get them stirred up to go to war? Preserve the Union. Preserve the Union. Preserve the Union. To the North, what is happening in South Carolina? From a Northern perspective, what's going on now? There? Rebellion. A rebellion. How many of you have served in the military? In your oath, didn't it go along the lines, I hereby swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. South Carolina had ripped that flag off the flagpole thrown in the dirt. We're Americans, we're kind of fun. You rip our flag down, step on it, we're going to have to hit you. Nothing personal, we're going to have to hit you. If you take our Constitution and rip it up, we're going to have to kick it as well as hit you. To the North, it was an out-and-out out rebellion. Our flag is trampled in the dust. They have torn the Constitution. 
they have rebelled against the United States of America. The Union, there's, uh, there's a Union version of Dixie, and the chorus is, uh, each Dixie boy must understand that he must mind his Uncle Sam. So the war starts in the North, not about slavery, but about preserving the Union. When and why and where does it change? Emancipation Proclamation. Emancipation Proclamation, 1862. One of the most incredible political documents, I think, ever done. Lincoln is losing the war. The Union is losing the war on every front. Our armies are being defeated. And I say are because, yeah, my, my relatives are getting their butt kicked at the moment then, too. Militarily, we're losing. Politically, we're losing. We're losing the public relations war. When you lose all the battles, yeah, the PR war kind of follows it. The northern population said, you know what? We had no idea we would be sending our boys off to war to die by the tens of thousands. It's not worth it. It's a legal question. Why are we killing off our fathers, our husbands, our brothers over a legal question of right of secession? Because at <coughs> that point, that's what they're fighting over. The right of those states who joined the Union to leave the Union. But the bigger and more immediate threat by 1862, the blockade and the lack of southern cotton is causing a, um, a depression, an economic depression in Britain. <coughs> now, when we think of Great Britain entering the war, the first thing that comes to mind is the Royal Navy. Britannia rules the waves. How long would it take Her Majesty's Navy to sweep the blockade from the southern coasts? About two weeks. But here is what we forget. Canada is not Canada yet. It's a collection of British colonies. And there are British soldiers and Canadian militia. The Civil War is the War of the National Guards. There's about 10,000 standing uh, federal soldiers at the beginning of the war. The way the National Guard or militia system works is that those armies belong to the governors. If there's a riot, if there's a natural disaster, the governor calls out the militia later known as the National Guard. If there is a national emergency, the states lend their militias to the president. Unless there is a more pressing state emergency, then they get to take them home, i.e. the draft riots in New York City in 1863. Stop and think when you look at the big states in the north who are sending their troops south. How many of them touch Canada? Almost all of them. New York State sends 500,000 men to the Union Army. It's a three-day march from Montreal to Albany. General Burgoyne took much longer than that. Well, that's one of the reasons he failed in 1777. If Britain enters the war, the Royal Navy sweeps the coast, red coats cross the border, every northern governor from Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, all the way up to the Great Lakes, calls their troops home to defend their states. Set, game, match. The war is over, the South is independent. What is the chink in the armor? What is the Achilles heel of a Confederate British alliance? Slavery. Queen Victoria is an abolitionist. Britain is abolitionist. Parliament is very anti-slavery. By putting out the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln is able in one fell swoop to have the British jump back and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, this changes things. And the British diplomats, you know, send, they send messages to Richmond saying, you know what, this is a game changer, but if you guys issue an Emancipation Proclamation, we're good with that, because that's back to the original legal argument of secession. So the Southern, the Confederate States of America comes to a fork in the road, and it's a clear choice. Independence with emancipation or possibly losing the war and everything to uphold the institution of slavery. Which fork in the road did they choose? They didn't emancipate the slaves, did they? In the North, it does a couple of things. It keeps Britain out of the war, but it also takes a very unpopular war and gives it a religious cause. It's now not just a political argument, it's a crusade. One of the greatest pieces of propaganda I have ever seen or heard is a song, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. If you can convince your soldiers 
they're doing the work of the Almighty? Are they not then invincible? Very, very powerful stuff. Um, and that's exactly what the Emancipation Proclamation does. It changes the whole war. It puts the North in unification behind it. It makes it a crusade. They now have a moral war, as well as a political and a legal war. And it keeps the British and French empires out of the question. France busies itself by conquering Mexico and doing all that stuff. OK, let's get to the other part. And we've got a few more minutes, and I'll let you guys take a break. The, the common man, we talked about why politicians start war. Why does Joe Snuffy go out to fight them? Can I ask why does Madison Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped that. Um, Vicksburg and Natchez, when they have the Mississippi uh, uh, Secession Convention over in Jackson, the delegates from Vicksburg and from Natchez are very much against secession. These are two of the richest cities in America. And you're saying, okay, so like starting next week, we want you to start shooting at your customers. Now, we may not have all graduated from the Wharton School of Business, but even we can figure it out when you start shooting at the cash customers, business tends to fall off. So Natchez and Vicksburg are very anti-secession. We have become rich trading with the North. Um, they're overruled the vote. Once Mississippi secedes, Vicksburg and Natchez fall in line. They are, of course, first and foremost, Mississippians. And Vicksburg raises several regiments. Natchez raises at least two that I know of. And the sons of Vicksburg and the sons of Natchez go out to fight for Mississippi and for the Confederacy. But they're looking at this, and you can tell, I mean, that, oh, well, this isn't going to end well. Particularly Vicksburg, because they know exactly that both presidents are looking at them, and even talking about them as early as 1861. Tim, I, I would add one more thing when you were talking about Emancipation Proclamation and the, and the infusion that that gives uh, to, to the, the North as a, as a holy war, as you say. Also, there are almost 200,000 black soldiers that come online. Too. Exactly. And Good point. That, that is a help. Yeah. Yeah. At a time when the South cannot replace its casualties, the North now has the chance to turn to the black man and say, do you want freedom? Would you like to fight for your own freedom? And enlist almost 200,000 troops into the Union Army, into the Union Navy. So again, the immigrants are still coming in. Now blacks are going to serve in the Northern Army. The, 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 the onus of the war that's falling on the white male population of serviceable age in the South is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as, as casualties are taken out. Let me just finish with this last part, and then we'll take some questions. Um, why did the individual fight? Well, actually, that's pretty easy. Uh, everyone goes to war for really their own reasons. In the North, we talked about it, the Northerner fought to suppress a rebellion, to uphold the Constitution, preserve the Union, and the Emancipation Proclamation brings in the religious crusade. The Southerner, what did, what, what did the Mississippian go to war for? They went to war to stop the Northern invaders. He was a, they were being invaded. You know, we're, again, we're a funny people. You turn on our flag, we're going to kick your butt. If we tell you we're coming down to your neighborhood and kick your butt, you go, yeah? Come on, bring it up. <laughs> they fought for home and hearth, their society, their neighbors, their family, their society, their way of life. Is there anything dishonorable about that? Not in my book. Not in my book. They were Americans who fought invaders, even though the other invaders were what? Americans. But the South was going to be invaded. It had to be invaded. Lincoln had to invade the South, overthrow the rebel governments, suppress the rebellion, and reestablish the United States. He had the harder of the two jobs. Jeff Davis just had to maintain his borders. So the Southerners, the Southern soldier, fought to protect his home, his loved ones, his way of life. I, say, I, I see nothing dishonorable in that. Uh, and I don't think anybody here does either. Or, or if you do, let's talk about it, because <laughs> that, that would get you into the minefield. Um, and then, OK, we're talking about young guys here. Why does every young guy go off and join the military? Sorry. Well, yeah, the recruiter, yeah, the recruiter lies to him. Because 
You're going to wear a uniform. You're going to be pretty. It's going to be a short war. You're going to come home a hero, and the girls are going to love you. We've fallen for that line for thousands and thousands of years. And like a friend of mine said, who, who went off on one of my grandmothers, who went off the First World War, I said, why'd you go to the war? He said, figured it was a whole lot more than walking around looking at a mule's butt all day. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. It was an adventure. It was sexy. Oh, yeah, and women are really going to think we're hot, particularly in that really nice uniform. You should have seen some of the early war uniforms, you know, the, the chasseurs and the, and, the, and the zouaves and stuff like that. A couple quick points. I checked this. I thought the winners always wrote the history. Is that a truism? Winners get to write the history? Sure, so. For the most part. The exception being the American Civil War. In the years right after the war, everyone knows what the war is about. They were there. As it gets on, the North is like, well, okay, the Gilded Age, the robber Berry, we have to finish up the rape of the West and clear out the rest of the Indians and take all the minerals and wealth out of the West because you know, we're a little busy here. The South can do whatever they want, you know. We don't care. The South, when it gets to the next generation, they're looking around, they're still, their economy's wrecked, their infrastructure's wrecked. What do you say to your son or your grandson? Daddy, how come the bridge is still down across the Big Black River? Well, because we wanted to keep our slaves. There just isn't that cachet about that answer, even though it's, it's true. We call it the lost cause. And yes, folks, trust me, you'll get people that think Gone with the Wind is a factual documentary. Start I'm telling you right now, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> and it's not just in the South. I mentioned um, Rutherford in there. In the early 20th century, she gets on this, this, this bandwagon, and she uses Northern economics against them. All the big textbook publishers, Houghton Mifflin and all the rest of them, are in New York, Philadelphia, Boston. But here's the way it works. In the North, every individual little school district buys their textbooks one at a time. In the South, we buy it state by state. So Rutherford gets together with the regions of the other southern states and says, look, if they don't tell the story of the Civil War the way we want them to, we don't buy the textbooks. Not just their history books, we don't buy any of their textbooks. Northern publishers could go, well, let's see. We could sell 24 copies of the Cambridge Central School District in Washington County, New York, or we could sell 50,000 in the state of Texas. If we tell it their way. What happens? <laughs> when I was in school, what was the Civil War about? States' rights and tariffs. And that was in a New York school district. Okay? So how we've told the story over the 20th century changes. Did it matter to the North? No. Was it important to the South? Yes, it was a bitter pill, it was a bitter defeat, and, and, and really, it, it, in the rearview mirror, because afterwards, they're sharecropping, they're poor, the South takes 100 years to recover from the Civil War. They're not going to tell their grandsons and great-grandsons, yeah, yeah it, was over, it was over slavery. It just, you know, that's, that's adding insult to injury to them. So, the story, the official accepted <coughs> story is gone with the wind. Uh, the birth of a nation, look at all the popular culture of the 20th century was into it. Um, what can we compare it to today? I'm going to skip ahead and take questions and get you guys ready. It is very difficult for Americans today to have any concept about the value and the impact of the cotton kingdom. The only thing that comes close today, oh, and by the way, let me regress for just a moment. When it talks about individual reasons for uh, fighting, does the individual reason have to coincide with the political reason? <coughs> Historians are already referring to the wars in the Middle East as the oil wars. Why, are we, why do we care? What's in Iraq that we have any interest in? Or Kuwait, or any place over there? Historians are already referring the Gulf Storm and all the or Desert Storm and then the Gulf Wars as the oil wars. Now, unless you want to get pisted, I would not recommend going up to a veteran saying, well, you were just over there fighting for Exxon or Shell. He or she's going to punch you upside of the head, and you got it coming. Those, those veterans, those soldiers, those sailors, those Marines, those airmen, they're going over there to fight the flag country and everyone in this room. Now, whether the politicians with the 2% are sending them on a mission that maybe we should question more, again, that's 
that's, that's another discussion. <coughs> but the soldier in the Civil War is the same thing. They're going off to fight for their own personal reasons, for their own family and stuff like that. And the whole oil, oil war, the only modern simile, the only thing I can come up with that's even remotely like cotton in the 1860s is oil in the 21st century. What would happen if the next president <coughs> running for the uh, presidency said, if elected, I will not make your SUV illegal, even though they're ineffective. But you know what, folks? Oil is costing us lives. It's costing us our environment. It's changing the climate. We're, 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 we're having thousands of our, of our sons and daughters go to a far distant part of the world to be killed because of our addiction on foreign oil. And if elected president, in the year 2020, not one single drop of foreign oil shall be imported into this country. That's when everybody looks at the uh, suburban in the driveway and goes, well, that goes the blue book value on that puppy. <laughs> That's when all the people up north go, holy mackerel. I mean, all right, I, I can buy a Yugo or something, but I heat my house with it. There's a lot of things that are option in living. When you live in a place where it goes down to 30 below zero, heat is not one of them. And if you're in the country, you heat with oil. Get a house in the suburbs. Let's get what little gas is left is going to go up to like 25 bucks a gallon. You got that beautiful, you know, three-bedroom ranch, 20 miles out of town. What happened to that market value? <laughs> that was what Lincoln's threat was to the South in 1860. If we had a president that was elected and said, "I'm just telling you right now, January 1st, 2020, I shut off the speed. and as president, I can do that. Not one drop of imported oil. Is that going to change the lives of everyone in this room? Do you think with that much money? That, just leave it right there, with that much money on the table, would we have a rebellion on our hands? I mean, history has a nasty habit of repeating itself, particularly among those who don't study it. I will stop there, let you guys have a break. I'll go out, so if you want to ask any questions, or I'll give David a chance to get his stuff uh, set up here. Let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. Come on in here at uh, 8 o'clock, and we'll get you out of here by 9.